Good morning. My name's Gary. If I've not had a chance to meet you, um, I'm one of the pastors here, and I get to help people connect in life groups. And I wanted to just kind of before I jump into my message here, I want to introduce you to a good friend of ours because I know this is going to embarrass her. Um, seated next to my wife is our good friend, Elisa. She is visiting us from Tampa, and um, she really misses the humidity. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, we are we're really glad to have her today. It just happens to be her birthday, so you can also, you know, yeah. Um, we talk a lot about here, uh, around here about welcome home and community and doing life together is really important. And I tell you, that she is an example of how rich it can be to do life and community. Um, Elisa and my wife um, got to hang out for four years, and of those four years, um, maybe two or three days of those four years you were apart, I think, <laughs> um, in, uh, in our home, not just going to church and things like that, and just a, a huge impact that she has had on, on our life. And I mentioned that to you to say going to church is great, but doing life with people um, through the nitty gritty, through the ups and the downs is really where it's at. And uh, it's just such rich blessings. And Elisa is an example of that for our life, and I hope you can experience the same. So uh, uh, we're going to look at uh, another story this week. We've been in a series called Change Your Story, Change Your Life, uh, dramatic experiences of life change. Some of them are dramatic like in an instant, and some of them kind of over time. We see how their lives have changed, and we hope that this is something that you can relate to and kind of gives you a desire for change. Um, I want to begin with a confession, and that is that I'm short. Um, I, am, uh, I, am, I am short. My, my dad was about a half inch taller than me. Uh, my brother is a good inch and a half, almost two inches taller. My sister married a guy that's 6'8", so he's like three inches taller. Uh, my dad had a couple of uncles that were 6'9". Um, and uh, when I played basketball in college, check that, when I went to college and was on the team, I never really played. Um, when, <laughs> um, our, our starting post player was 6'11", and we had two other 6'9 guys. Um, so in a way, I'm, I'm short by comparison, but I'm not talking about comparisons today. I'm talking about the fact that I am short because Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In other words, um, I'm short because of the poor choices that I have made. Um, compared to God's standards, I'm short. Now, it'd be easy if we were going to just play the comparison game. I could make myself feel pretty tall by finding people that are shorter than me, um, spiritually speaking. And... I want you to know that my story of life change is one that um, I've learned that no one is too short, no one is so far from God that God can't see them and change their story. So there's a bummer here, we are short, but the great news is that God can still see us. And so I want to highlight this morning just three kind of uh, steps or key ingredients for this process of changing our lives for our story, having a dramatic ending from the direction that it's heading right now. And before we do that, we're going to look at our passage. And it's in Luke 19. And yes, it is the story of a guy that was really short by the name of Zacchaeus. And it's this exchange between uh, Zacchaeus and Jesus, and it's a story about life change and how this guy, even though he was short, um, he was not overlooked. Verse 1, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Can I just kind of make a little comment on Jesus entered? Anytime you read in Scripture that Jesus entered, there's a really cool story that's about to take place at every time. Um, when you know people that have allowed Jesus to enter into their life, a really cool story is in process of being written. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. He was passing through on his way to Jerusalem. He was passing through on his way to Jerusalem where in a few short days, he would be arrested. He would be tried, he would be convicted and crucified. 
He was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, I am standing up. Get it? It's kind of, kind of a short joke. <laughs> okay. Let's I'll stick with scripture. Okay. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, I thought that was really funny. I don't know. Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Before we look at the details of this, I want you to know that Luke, the gospel writer, more than the other gospel writers, emphasizes um, Jesus' love for the outsiders and the outcasts. Luke emphasizes um, that those that were kind of outside of the accepted norms, whether in the religious world or just outcast for other reasons, those were just, the, he highlights those stories of Jesus moving towards them compassionately and loving them. In fact, it's probably that last verse that we read that may be the key verse for Luke's entire gospel. Jesus came to seek and to save those who are lost. He came to offer salvation to everyone. He came to offer salvation to the shortest of the short. And this is great news. There were a couple of obstacles that kept Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus that day. I want to kind of mention these and draw some parallels. And the first obstacle obviously was his stature. And I don't know about you, but I've kind of wondered, how short is Zacchaeus? And the Bible doesn't really tell us, you know, like he was two and a half cubits tall or anything like that. We don't really know um, how, how tall or short he was. But what we do know is that he was looked down on, not just literally, but as a society, they looked down on him. In fact, they despised him. Um, and that's really the type of short that Jesus came to seek and to save. So how spiritually short was Zacchaeus? Well, they tell us his occupation, and I know you would think anyone that works for the government and collects taxes is an angel. Um, but in that day, contrary, um, this was someone uh, that worked for the Roman government. So if you can imagine the Jewish, his Jewish friends were of the, uh, of the mindset of here is this Jewish man, Zacchaeus, who is working for the enemy. And the way that they would collect taxes, he would set up a booth, usually in a, in a popular um, thoroughfare. He would collect taxes, and the money that he made was made by kind of deceitfully and, and in a conniving way, kind of skimming off the top, having those people pay a little bit more than what they were required to pay so that he could pocket the difference. And so he was looked at as the lowest of the low. Other places in Scripture... Um, you'll see kind of these, these lists of real dark sins, you know, like prostitutes and tax collectors, for real. Like they're included with the people that nobody wanted to associate with. Indeed, he was selfish, deceitful, calloused, and conniving. And I can't help but wonder if his physical stature was an outward manifestation of what he felt on the inside, lonely and overlooked. You and I are short. The inward reality is that we have made poor decisions that isolate us from God. Our sins become an obstacle that keep us from clearly being able to see Jesus. And we might get on our tiptoes of our righteous acts, but still we behave in ways that keep us from seeing Jesus for who he really is. And there was a second obstacle, and it was the crowd of people. Now, here at, um, here at Central, we describe a follower of Jesus as one, a disciple who is committed to live like Jesus lived. We want to we love like Jesus loved. We want to live like Jesus lived. 
And so the picture that we have here is there is a crowd of people following Jesus, but these aren't followers like disciples who want to live like Jesus. These are people who are just kind of intrigued. They kind of jumped on the bandwagon. Uh, They've heard of some of the things that he does. They are admirers and fans, but they are not followers. They have not really given their life over to follow him and to become like him. In fact, I wonder if those same people followed Jesus through Jericho all the way to Jerusalem. I wonder if those were some of the same people who laid palm branches before him one day saying, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, save us. And then a few days later, we're shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And then after that, in Jesus' darkest hour, they deserted him. In other words, these people were more wall than window for Zacchaeus. So I'm gonna ask you, are there people in your life who keep you from seeing Jesus? And before we kind of come up with a list of all the evil people that we work with or something like that, can we be really honest and say that sometimes people who go to church can hinder our view of Jesus? Sometimes even people that might be doing pretty good on the outside can keep us from a personal encounter. Um, Maybe you are someone that's just kind of relied on the testimony, almost like the rumors of these people who are fans of Jesus, instead of you yourself being able to catch a fresh glimpse of him for yourself. Um, Who are the people in your life that have kind of become a barrier or an obstacle to you seeing Jesus? Obstacles and barriers have always stood between people and God. We see this all the way through from Genesis 3 on. There is always some type of an obstacle or a barrier standing between the people and God, but none of these obstacles and barriers ever were like a curveball to God. He knew that there would be obstacles. He knew that these barriers were going to be there. He anticipated them, and for every obstacle, he made a provision. So what did God provide for Zacchaeus? A tree. So the obstacles between you and I and a fresh encounter with Jesus, one of the ways that we can overcome this is by climbing a tree. So this is the first step. If you want to change your story and change your life, the first step is climbing a tree. Now, I know many of you um, anticipated that uh, coming to church. You know, you're maybe going to have picnic with family tomorrow. Hey, what'd you, what'd you learn in church? Well, um, I got to climb a tree today. Uh, thank goodness we're having a picnic in the park and we're going to, yeah. So climbing a tree, what do I mean by climbing a tree? About 18 years ago, um, I was kind of chewing on this passage. I was on the back deck of our condo in Maryland Heights, Beth, and was kind of Reading through the passage, it wasn't one that was brand new to me. I knew the song when I was a little kid. Some of you have been singing that wee little man song already. Um, was very familiar with it, but this day in particular was a day, just a, a real key moment in my life when I really sensed in my spirit that God was saying, I created you to climb trees for a fresh glimpse of Jesus. I created you to experience a fresh glimpse of me. And so what do I mean by a tree, by climbing a tree? This is what I mean. A tree represents any place that helps you rise above the perspective of your sin-short life so you can catch a fresh glimpse of Jesus. It's the place where you can rise above the roar of the crowd so you can hear his voice. Climbing a tree is actively positioning yourself to catch a fresh glimpse of Jesus. And I'm not talking about just kind of relying on some snapshot of Jesus years ago in your life. I'm talking today, in this moment. Like before you do anything else, you want to do your best in the morning, climb a tree to catch a fresh glimpse of Jesus and let that be the filter, the change of perspective that you have for the rest of your day, something fresh today. A tree is any place that we are willing to go out of our way of out of our way for in order to catch um, a fresh glimpse and to hear Jesus saying our name. I want to begin the day with Jesus speaking my name and me hearing his name. Try and get up when the house is still quiet 
to read my Bible and to journal and to pray. Um, the only thing that's of more priority than that would be fixing the cup of coffee before I read my Bible and journal and pray. Um, maybe things get a little bit hectic during the day, and I want to take a, take a moment, a midday break, where I close my laptop, and I get quiet, and I climb a tree. I want to catch a fresh glimpse of Jesus in the middle of the day. Could be in the evening rather than television or something like that. I pull out uh, just some enriching Christian book of some kind and allow myself to marinate in that um, at night before I go to bed or while I'm in bed even. Just before I close my eyes, I kind of process the day. God, how were you making yourself present and known to me? What were the ways that I climbed a tree and got to see you? Were there some trees that you had planted along the way that I missed? How did I miss seeing you today? Um, I walk into this auditorium. This is a tree. This is a place where we can catch a fresh glimpse of Jesus. This is a place where we can engage in worship and we can see him in a fresh and relevant way through the reading of scripture, through the ways that it's expounded upon it. Our purpose is to point you to Jesus. It's not to see anybody up here. It is for you to walk out of here and say, this was a great tree because I got to see Jesus. Now I want you to understand what was taking place culturally speaking for Zacchaeus. Um, men in that day typically did not run and they would not be climbing trees. That's something that kids do. Uh, kids run, kids climb trees. Um, if you saw me up in a tree in the parking lot, you would probably go, hmm, all right. <laughs> Gary's out of his meds. And, uh, <laughs> but if you see a kid up in a tree, you're just like, oh, that kid's having fun, right? So Zacchaeus is doing something that's actually drawing attention to his lack of height. Do you see that? He is actually kind of, for a guy that probably didn't want to draw attention to his deficiencies, what he is doing is he is emphasizing something that he would normally try to hide. Now, if you hear that I climb a tree and I'm reading my Bible every day or doing these different disciplines, you might be tempted to think Gary is a spiritual giant, but I want you to know that is not the case. I climb a tree because I'm not a giant. I climb a tree because I'm not tall. I climb a tree because I'm short. I climb a tree first thing in the morning because I know what I did the day before. And I need to catch a fresh glimpse. I need that do-over. I climb a tree because I know of the barriers that have been in my way. And this is a way for me to kind of overcome some of those things. What we see in Zacchaeus is someone who was willing to break from the routine because he was desperate. When I climb a tree, it's actually a picture of my desperation, not my discipline. When I climb a tree, it's not because I'm spiritual, it's because I'm sinful. But this desperation is what keeps pulling me back day in and day out. What I saw yesterday was awesome. I wanna position myself again today to see Jesus in a fresh and life-changing way. And when we take our sin-shortened self and we draw attention to the fact that we are sin-shortened, I mean, if we really wanted to kind of fool people, we would kind of say, no, I don't go to church. I don't, I don't need to. <laughs> I don't know about you. One reason I'm here is because I need this. One reason I open my Bible is because I need what is in there to move into here to change my story and to change my life. It's this ongoing process. We don't ever grow out of this. But out of desperation, we do this, and we can do this with confidence because Jesus loves short people. He loves sin-shortened people. He is, uh, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the earth to see whose heart is fully committed to him. Who's desperate enough? He's kind of saying, do you want it? Do you desire this? Because he came to seek and to save, not the spiritual giants, he came to seek and to save those who are lost. You could say that he came to seek and to save those who are short. And he calls out to Zacchaeus by name. Did you get that? He sees him and he doesn't, hey, you little short guy. <laughs> 
He didn't refer to him in the way that I'm sure everyone else called him, minus the expletives. He called him by name. How did he know his name? Well, I can kind of speculate a few possibilities. It could be that Zacchaeus had a reputation that preceded him, that Jesus knew who that was because of all of the rumors that had been going around about this really little guy that had a huge ego and a craving for greed that was insatiable. Or maybe he heard of Zacchaeus by way of one of his own disciples, Matthew, who used to be a tax collector, but whose story had changed, and now he's a disciple. And maybe Matthew had told Jesus in advance, hey, when we're going through Jericho, I know this guy. And it would be great for you to meet him. Or maybe it was just one of those sovereign God things. Maybe it was just one of those moments where the Son of Man and the Son of God, it was, he was... He was all son of God in that moment, and he's like, that's Zacchaeus. I know it. It's confirmed in my spirit. And I wonder what that was like for him to hear that voice. And this is a key key point I want to make. Zacchaeus' life reminds us that though we are short, we are not overlooked. Did you catch that? Though we are short... Though we have fallen short of the glory of God, he does not look over us. He does not say, hmm, nice try, you failed, let me find somebody else. He's like, no, you are the one that I came to seek and to save and to love, and I want to call you by name. Isaiah 49, 15 and 16 says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Maybe Jesus is walking through Jericho, and he's like, huh, Zacchaeus, I'll never forget you. He calls him by name. When I climb a tree, I have positioned myself to hear my name as God calls me. One reason I like climbing a tree to hear who Jesus calls me is because I know what the crowd has to say about me. Can anybody relate to that? Anybody have a reputation with a crowd? You know the name that they call you, and that echoes really loud in your head. Or maybe you just know the unhealthy and demeaning names that you call yourself in those dark, sin-shortened seasons. But when you climb a tree, you position yourself to hear Jesus calling you by your real name. He sees you. He sees that you desire him because you are up in that tree. You are seeking seeking him. Climbing a tree requires you to go out of your way. It requires effort. Gravity is going to want to pull you back down. There will be a multitude of reasons that will pull on you to keep you from climbing a tree. The enemy does not want you to catch a fresh glimpse of Jesus. The enemy does not want you to hear who you truly are as God created you to be. I'm short, but I'm also desperate. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So the question to ask yourself is not, are you short? Or how short are you? The big question is, how desperate are you? Because we could compare I mean, I I would say probably very few of us would deny the fact that we're short, that we've made poor choices, that we've sinned. But it's it's easy to get into this comparison game. But we're we're not trying to see who in here is shorter or taller, spiritually speaking, than one another. The question that we have to wrestle with is how desperate are we? Are we willing to go out of our way? Are we willing to break from a normal routine? Because desire is where our stories of life change begin. A lot of changed lives begin by active steps of deep curiosity, an unnameable hope, a restless desperation. Desire is a catalyst for life change, for us to experience this new story. Now, I want to be clear here. I'm not guaranteeing that if you climb a tree for a fresh glimpse of Jesus, that you're going to have this magical, fantastical encounter, and you're going to see Jesus every time you get up early to read your Bible, or every time you walk into this auditorium, or every time you stop to pray in the middle of your work day, I'm just saying that desire is one of those things that causes us to position ourselves for whenever God calls out our name. We are in a position. 
to begin to see him because of, of what he has done. So desire is a key step, but it's not the only step. This isn't some, hey, if you want this, you can be whoever you want to be. You know, this is just saying that I desire to be who God is creating me to be. And desire is this catalyst. It's the first step. And it causes us to climb a tree. So what is the other component? If the first step is to climb a tree, the second step towards changing your story is repentance. Repentance. It's a churchy word, but it has a real vivid definition. Um, it's been brought up several times in this series because repentance is crucial for everyone's story to change. This is an irreplaceable component. Repentance is more than feeling anguish and regret. Um, it's more than just remorsefully falling at an altar and crying out to God. Repentance and its biblical meaning is to experience a change of life by way of a change of perspective. In other words, you recognize that you've been living a sin-shortened life and instead of continuing with this perspective, you want a different perspective. You want a taller, different perspective. Could there be a better picture of a changed perspective than climbing in a tree? Now, we might have to think back to our childhood days, but isn't that part of why you do it? You see the world differently when you've climbed a tree? I believe that when we climb a tree, when we engage ourselves for the purpose of catching a fresh glimpse of Jesus, it will change our perspective. Now picture this. I wonder when Zacchaeus climbed that tree, I wonder if off in the distance he could see his tax collecting booth. And with that, I wonder if he just kind of had this punched in the gut feeling, just knowing all that that represented, the wrong and the regret. And I wonder if he had a new perspective on people, people that were always looking down on him. Now he's looking down on them. Now he's looking at them maybe in a way that he's never looked at them before. And then this is the ultimate change of perspective. He sees Jesus. And he's used to seeing people seeing him and avoiding him. But he sees Jesus and Jesus walks towards him. And instead of kind of muttering his name under his breath like everyone else does, Jesus calls him out by name and says, I don't want to avoid you. I don't even want to walk by you. I want to spend time with you. Will you open up your home so that we can hang out? And I wonder if with this change of perspective, if he began to see himself in that moment differently. I wonder if he began for the first time to see himself through the lens of warmth and grace and hope and a new chance. When you climb a tree, when you seek a fresh glimpse of Jesus, we hope that these are some of the things that you encounter. When you come here on a Sunday, we hope that you have a changed perspective, a changed perspective on, the, on your workplace. Even if it's a good, respectable job, what if you had a new take on that, a changed perspective? How about the people around you? Even the people that are against you? What if you walked out of here with a changed perspective? Of course, what if you walked out of here instead of thinking that God was out to get you, <laughs> he was out to win you. He doesn't want to walk by you. He knows you by name. What if you walked out of here with a new perspective of yourself? Giving yourself a second chance showing yourself some warmth and some grace as Jesus would. These are the types of perspectives that can be changed. And what we see in Zacchaeus is his story is starting to change. His story is, is making that turn. So I urge you to climb a tree. May your time in the tree and your time seeing Jesus change your perspective on your current way of life, your, cur your current perspective on the people around you, the work that you do, the way that you relate with the living God who comes to you. And then there's a third component. As I said, I think we, we climb this tree with desire. We repent. We begin to have a change of perspective. 
But there's one more ingredient that's really significant if our life is actually going to change. And this is where the rubber meets the road. The third step towards changing your story is opening your life to Jesus. Zacchaeus, we, we see here, opened up his home. And Jesus said, um, I must come into your house today. Now, culturally speaking, that was significant. That was kind of like Jesus saying, I want to enter into a friendship with you. I want to know you. I want you to be fully known and fully accepted as you are. That's what it meant to enter into someone's home and to share a meal. It, in some ways, it meant I'm going to take on whatever is burdening you as I enter into your home. That's how close I want to be with you. Maybe in a more contemporary and a church vernacular, we would say, this is opening up our heart to Jesus. This is opening up our life and saying, Jesus, I want you to come in and knowing that you're going to love and accept me as I am. But also, we see in Zacchaeus' life that this wasn't a chance for him to be loved and accepted by Jesus and continue to live the way that he was. This is where his story changed. And Zacchaeus says, I need to give to the poor. What I've taken, I want to pay back. I want to reconcile with the people that I've wronged and the people that are disadvantaged. I want to take what I have in my possession and give to them. And this is where it's tough. Maybe you're desperate enough for a fresh glimpse of Jesus that you'll climb a tree, but are you also desperate enough for Jesus for him to change your life as he deems best? Because that's where it's tough. Jesus, I want you in my life. I need some changes to take place. And if you don't mind, Jesus, could you pick up a pen? Because I'm going to tell you the ways that I I want my life to change. (laughs) And we kind of have these stipulations. But Zacchaeus, his story changed because he gave Jesus the pen, and then you write it. There is a new story that Jesus wants to write in your life. This next chapter could be amazing. But it's tough to hand someone else the pen and tell them to write the next chapter for your life. But this is what we see that Zacchaeus did. Earlier in Luke, there's this guy that's just known as the rich young ruler. And Jesus said to him, I want you to sell all you have and give your possessions to the poor. And he was like, uh, nope, not going to do it. In other words, he took the pen back. I would rather just kind of write my own story. But Zacchaeus handed him the pen and said, you write it. And I trust that this is going to be good because you are the one who came to seek and to save those who are lost. If you accept Jesus into your life, how could that change your life? How could your story, beginning today, have a new chapter? We have a desire. We climb a tree. We repent. We have this change of perspective. We see things differently because of Jesus. And then we open our heart, a personal and life-altering encounter with Jesus. I want to turn the corner towards communion. I just want to say a couple of things. A barrier exists between you and God. A barrier exists between me and God. This is something, there is always some type of an obstacle. Can we be honest about that? Even if we have come in walking as tall as we've ever walked before, we are probably encountering some kind of a barrier between us and God. And our obstacle is that we are short spiritually. And as I said earlier, God always made provisions for the obstacles we face. We will never encounter a barrier without God also providing a way. Zacchaeus encountered obstacles, God provided a tree. What has God provided for you to overcome the obstacles that you are facing? He provided a tree. But I want this tree to think of this as a capital T. The obstacle that you're facing, a capital T, tree, is the way for you to overcome that, the cross. And I suppose this is where our metaphor of the tree is going to change. There is a tree that leads to salvation, but this tree was too difficult for you and I to climb So Jesus climbed that tree on our behalf. Remember, trees are for short people. 
Trees are for sin-shortened people. And Jesus, although he lived a sinless life, took upon himself our sins, bearing our sins on that tree. And by accepting Jesus' atoning sacrifice, the barrier between you and God gets chopped down. Communion is a, sober, uh, is a somber celebration of remembrance. Communion is a time to remember that Jesus' body was pierced on that tree. Communion is a time to remember that Jesus' blood was shed on that tree. Communion is a time for us to remember that Jesus climbed that tree because we are short, but we are not overlooked. That's the good news. That's the gospel. If you're here um, with us in a way that th this is not your, your normal church home, but you have opened your life up to Jesus, I hope that this is a deep time of remembering that Jesus climbed that tree for you. Or maybe through the act of communion, this is your step. This is the new turning point in your story where you are saying, thank you, Jesus, for climbing that one tree that I couldn't climb, for being for me who I could not be for myself. Let's pray. Father, um, thank you for loving me as I am. Thank you that um, because you love me, I can confess that I am short without being ashamed. I can declare that I am short and that you love me so much that you wanted to rescue me from this sin-shortened life. I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room that as we confess to our sins, as we prepare our hearts for this special meal, that we will hear you calling us by name and that we will know that we are not overlooked, that you are again saying, I want to come into your home, I want to dwell there. Father, if you're knocking on the door right now, come on in. Make yourself at home with us as we share this meal in Jesus' name.